Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, good afternoon. As Amy said, my name is Erin Mullen and I'm the chair of Young Guns for 2020. Excited to have everyone on this second virtual call today. Uh, before we begin our discussion, a few housekeeping notes. We place all participants on mute for the duration of our moderated conversation. After the moderated conversation, we will open up for questions from the audience. Please submit your questions to the host, Kristen Orius, via the chat function at any time. At the conclusion of the discussion, please stay on the call to be placed in a breakout room for the virtual networking portion of this event. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dale Petrowski, President and CEO of the Dallas Regional Chamber. Dale joined the Dallas Regional Chamber in 2014. Prior to this role, Dale's career, Dale's career excuse me, placed him in Washington, D.C. for 18 years, most notably as Assistant Press Secretary to President Ronald Reagan. After his time at the White House, he served as Senior Vice President for Missions Programs at the National Geographic and President of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York. In 2008, Dale settled in Texas as Executive Vice President of Marketing and Community Development for the Texas Rangers baseball team. We are excited to have him here today to discuss perseverance and how Dallas can move forward despite the uncertain times. Thank you and welcome, Dale. Okay, hi, Aaron. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Absolutely. So you have a fascinating professional background in strategic communications, public affairs, mm -hmm. management, and that has taken you through a number of institutions with varying industries. Um, how did you go about determining what skills and experience were necessary for your personal career development? You know, um, all I really want, I, I graduated from Michigan State with a degree in journalism and political science. And so I was interested in the news business and I was interested in the political world. And, but all I really cared about was I wanted to do two things. I wanted to live an interesting life and I wanted to do really well at what I did. I wanted to give it my all. And so my first job out of school was right there in the state capitol building in Lansing, uh, working in the House uh, Republican office. Uh, and so I got into politics that way. I didn't know that that's where I would start, but that's where I started. And uh, then I had an opportunity to run a congressional campaign for one of the state reps who wanted to go to Washington. And I was 25 years old. He asked me to run his campaign. I did. And we gave it our all and we won. And I got to Washington uh, a couple of years after graduating from college. Never dreamed of that. That was beyond my wildest dreams. Went to work on the Hill. I was a chief of staff for a congressman on the Hill and did that for about three and a half years and then got invited down to the White House to be President Reagan's assistant White House press secretary. So the combination of journalism and political science was what was woven through all of that. And so I did that, and then um, President Reagan's term was coming to an end uh, in 1988. And uh, I just happened, um, and th this is a good lesson for everybody, is, is uh, I always tell my, young, my, young ch my children who are in their 30s, I say, look, there's only two things you really need to know. Work when no one's watching. When you need to know it needs to get done, if it's three in the morning, you gotta work. You know, work when no one's watching. And when, and when you're working, work as if everyone's watching. Because everyone's paying attention to everything you do every day. They're picking up cues from you. And they're determining whether they think you're a professional or not. Or whether you're good to people or not. You have a generosity of spirit and so forth. So I, my time was coming to an end in, 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 with the Reagan administration. And I get a call one day from a gentleman I had worked with in the White House a few years before. His name was Bob Sims, and he had just been hired as the first ever senior vice president for communications at National Geographic. And he called me up and he said, hey, uh, what are you doing after the Reagan administration is over? And I said, I haven't really thought about it. He said, why don't you come with me to National Geographic? So that's how I got to National Geographic. He invited me to join him. And I had 12 incredible years at National Geographic, unbelievable place to work, the best writers, the best photographers, people had been just come home from all over the world, showing us their portfolios, telling us stories. Um, and it was, it was like graduate school every single day. I was 
learning about the physical world. I was learning about the cultural world. I was learning about the political world. And I was really able to sit down and talk to these amazingly worldly people. So I was there for 12 years. I had, um, I had risen to the rank of senior vice president. I was the youngest senior vice president at National Geographic. And so I thought I had a chance to be president of National Geographic. And um, one day I get a call from my buddy who said, Dale, there's a job you need to have. And I said, what do you mean? I've already got the job I need to have. He says, no, I mean it. He's the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame. And my, I, was, I was taken by that. That, that really, uh, my passion in life has always been baseball. Uh, since I was a five-year-old little boy, I played on two national championship teams growing up, played with eight guys who made the major league. So baseball was in my blood. And everybody in Washington knew it. And so I threw my hat in the ring, and lo and behold, I was chosen to be president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and, and went up to Cooperstown for nine years and, um, and had a wonderful experience there, a lot, you know, a lot of wonderful times and stories. And then um, and our kids were all raised in Cooperstown. And then when they were all getting through school, I get a call from Nolan Ryan, who was one of my Hall of Famers, who had just become the president of the Texas Rangers down here. And he said, why don't you come on down here and be part of my team down here? So I came down to, to Dallas and was the um, executive vice president for the Rangers marketing. And then they had a new ownership. And, you know, as we've seen in the last month or two, life doesn't always go the way you think it's going to go. Things happen. So we had new ownership. Nolan's gone. I am gone. I moved to California. My wife and I moved to California and worked in the energy industry for a couple of years. And then I got a call that Ambassador Oberwetter, who had been the chamber president, was retiring, and they wanted me to apply for this position. So, so I did, and, and I was chosen. So that was six years ago, so here I am. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think, I think um, what I've done is whenever the next big opportunity came along and I thought it was a good uh, career move and an interesting move, I was, I was uh, not uh, too shy about taking it. Yeah, it sounds a lot like you were working when no one was watching and people were taking notice and kept calling you for the opportunities as opposed to you necessarily having to seek them out. Right. Well, that's that's what you want. You want people to be saying, come with me, come with me. Right. Sure. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to dig in on kind of each of those milestones, starting with, you know, your career in the political world between the Michigan House Republican Caucus um, former rep Bill Goodling of Pennsylvania, assistant press secretary under Ronald Reagan, the Department of Transportation. It sounded like you didn't necessarily intend to get into pol politics and public policy, but um, I'm curious to know what kept you there. What um, was there any allure? <clears throat> yeah, I think I think what I loved about politics, it's a very social business. You know, it's about relationships. And that was me. I mean, I loved relationships and I loved the social part of it. Uh, and, and we were doing, we were working for things that we thought would make the world a better place. So the combination of it being social, doing things that you thought were going to make things better. And then the news business, which is what I was always drawn to as a college student, um, was a nice sort of mix of everything in one for me in all those worlds. And so every day was exciting for me. And I was, frankly, I was, as a young person right out of school, very green. You know, I, I studied politics and journalism theoretically, but I hadn't really practiced it. And so every day I was learning and trying to get a little bit better at it. And, um, and over time, you do it every day and you work hard at it every day, you begin to learn it and get pretty good at it. And so, so um, I think that's what I liked. I liked it was social. We were doing things to make the world a better place. It involved journalism. And uh, I, once I really got into it, I liked learning it and liked getting better at it. And so in 1988, when you, you know, started your 11 year career with Nat Geo, what intrigued you? What, um, you know, gave you the courage to, to make such a, a big shift? Um, and what exactly, when you started there, what did you hope to accomplish with that organization? Well, National Geographic is one of those brands that, uh, you know, there are very few brands like National Geographic. 
I mean, it was, it had been around a hundred years when I got there. In fact, I joined it in, in our, in our centennial year. And, um, I just knew that it was a really quality organization doing great things, uh, exposing people to different parts of the world that they really didn't know much about or, uh, taking, uh, take, taking environmental positions on certain things that I believed in. My wife, uh, is a, that was a naturalist uh, before our kids were born. And so she has a great love for the outdoors and for the environment. And she really introduced me to the geographic years before. I mean, the reading of the reading of National Geographic, watching geographic specials. And, um, and then, but, but there's political Washington, which is most of Washington. And there are a few other great brands in Washington that are not political. And geographic was one of those brands. And I really didn't want to spend my entire life in politics, to be honest with you. I, and I never wanted to be a lobbyist. That never interested me. A lot of my friends who were in politics went into lobbying, and I just thought that was not for me. And so I didn't know what my next move was going to be, and poof, here's National Geographic. I mean, it was like the ultimate brand uh, and uh, doing really interesting things with interesting people, and I got to do it. Now... Yeah, the other, the great upside of this job was I was hired for the role to be vice president of communications, public affairs, I guess they called it. And um, very early on, uh, I became very close um, to the CE, chairman and CEO, Gil Grosvenor, who, um, whose family had run geographic for about 95 years at that point. Uh, they were the they were the uh, descendants of Alexander Graham Bell. Bell was one of our first leaders at National Geographic, and uh, uh, Gil's grandfather ran it for 56 years. His dad ran it for like 30 years, and then Gil uh, had taken over. So, and he he saw that I had I think it was my political background that I understood how to staff someone, and he pulled mm -hmm. me uh, close to him and made me sort of his de facto chief of staff. So, in that role, I really got to see everything going on at the geographic rather than just my my silo and that was really fascinating and i loved my time at geographic and as i said if the baseball hall of fame hadn't come along I, i'm sure i'd still be there today well on that note i imagine that working in sports is a bit of a dream scenario for a lot of people was that true for you as well in joining the national baseball hall of fame and what was that experience like so I'll tell you a story uh, to, to, to try to capture how much I love baseball. So when I was five years old, my dad put a glove on me. And, and from that moment, I was smitten. That's all I wanted to do was play. I played all the sports, but I really love baseball. I love playing it. I love watching it. I love going to the stadium. When I was 11 years old and 12 years old, I took the bus down with my buddies to Tiger Stadium in Detroit uh, to, to go to every game and to work as a boy usher, a volunteer boy usher. We, get, we didn't get paid, but we got into the stadium to wipe seats for people. That was how we got into the stadium. So I loved it so much, I would take my whole night and go down and do that. And I did it probably 70 games a year. You know, I lo just love being in the ballpark. So anyway play, play on a couple national championship teams, then my career comes to an end like it does for everybody. And um, did not play professionally, wasn't good enough to play professionally, but I still just loved it. Anyway, and everybody in Washington knew that. So I, so I, I get chosen to be president of the Baseball Hall of Fame. And my dad is, my wife and three, three uh, elementary school children stay in Virginia. Uh, for, for my first weekend in Cooperstown. I started in July for, for induction weekend. And I invited my dad, just my dad, not my mom and dad, but just my dad to join me for that weekend. Because my dad's the one who put that glove on my hand and taught me to love baseball. And it was, a, it was like a dream to be with my dad. And now I'm the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame. So the first night of the weekend is a Friday night reception, cocktail reception. And all the Hall of Famers have returned to Cooperstown for that weekend. So here's, here's Hank Aaron, Stan Musial, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, you know, Al Kaline, Harmon Killebrew, all of my boyhood heroes I'm meeting for the first time. And I'm the guy. I'm now the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame. 
and I and for a minute we had a break there for a minute. I looked over. My dad was standing over uh, nearby, and he was talking to somebody, and and he had a glass of wine, and I could just see tears streaming down his face. And and um, later that night, about one in the morning, party had ended. We were walking back to to my place, and uh, I said, "Dad, you okay?" And he said, "Yeah. Why Why do you ask?" I said, "Well, I just noticed you were." Seemed to be a little bit upset. He said, upset? He says, he says I just couldn't contain the emotions uh, thinking that the little boy I put that glove on grew up to be the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame. And so it was that, it was that special, and it, it remained that special for all nine years. And it was an unbelievable run of, um, of um, just the things I got to be involved in. My two greatest thrills... Um, the, the two greatest things I'm proudest of, I guess, is we took a, um, an exhibit outside of Cooperstown for the first time. We took Cooperstown to the American people. Cooperstown's a very hard place to get to. It's only 2,300 people. It's about four hours from New York City in rural America, hard to get to. And we got the idea, let's take Cooperstown to the people. So we put together an idea for a traveling exhibit on, on, called Baseball is America from the Baseball Hall of Fame. And, but we needed $5 million to do it. And this is, this is quite a story. So, so one of our board members was the former CEO of Ernst & Young. We call it EY today, okay? And um, I asked him, could you, uh, Bill, could you introduce me to the new CEO of Ernst & Young and see if we can get that $5 million so we can take the traveling exhibit out? He said, sure. So he took me to um, the Twin Towers in New York City on uh, September 7th, 2001. I want you to remember that day, September 7th. And talked to Jim Turley, who was the new CEO of Ernst & Young. Jim said, I love the idea. Give me a couple days to think about it. Call me next week. And so, of course, what happened next week was 9-11. And, uh, and so I talked to Bill Gladstone. I said, Bill, I just don't feel right calling Jim about this right now. He said, look, call him. All, all he can do is tell you no, you know. So I called Jim Turley um, uh, on the 14th, three days after 9-11. Almost embarrassed to ask this question. He said, Dale, yeah, I can't think of a better time to sponsor an exhibit called Baseball as America than right now. And they gave us $5 million for the exhibit. And it was the biggest there's the most money anybody had ever paid for a traveling exhibit in the history of the United States. And so we took that exhibit to 10 American museums, great, great museums, uh, and then five more of the next year. And so it was, it was really a thrill. The second big thrill for me was to put together a process so that um, all the Negro leaguers who deserved to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame had a chance to be. We had, we had inducted 17 already. But um, there were many more who deserved to be. There were a lot of great ball players there. But nobody knew quite how to do it because it, they didn't match up against um, major league players apples to apples. They didn't play in the major leagues. The stats were a little bit um, spotty. So we put together a research project to make sure we had all the stats. Uh, and we got about 95% of them. And then we had a whole process. We, we, um, we looked at uh, 96 names, took it down to 54. And then uh, in, September, in uh, July of 2006, we put in um, 17 more Negro League players all at once. And that was, a, that was a big thrill, thrilling moment for me, too. So we got to do a lot of cool stuff. I, can, I could talk, talk for a long time about uh, the things I got to do. Sure. Well, transitioning to your current role now, Dallas Regional Chamber was founded in 1909 and has a very long history of serving as a voice for the business community, but some of our participants might not be as familiar with the organization. So can you kind of give us a brief overview, your, your elevator pitch at the Dallas Regional Chamber and how, how you all serve the Dallas region? Sure. Well, first of all, first thing you need to understand is there are 175 chambers in Dallas, Fort Worth, believe it or not. There are a lot of small chambers, ethnic chambers, and so forth. So there are 175 First thing you need to understand is we're the largest and we're twice as big as the second biggest. So there's us and then 174 way down the list from us. We're the big regional chamber. 
And regional is important for a couple of reasons. When we go out and recruit companies to look at this area to move to, we don't care where they land. If they like a campus, we take them up and introduce them to Plano and Frisco. If they like to be near the airport, we take them to Irving. If they like to be in the tech corridor, we take them to Richardson. If they like to be downtown, we take them downtown. If they like to be in Southern Dallas, we take them to Southern Dallas. So we have no um, stake in where they end up. We just want them to be in the region. So that's a big part of what we do. The second thing is regional is important because on public policy issues in Austin and Washington, uh, there are no boundaries on education and water and uh, infrastructure and things like that. So, so we just really want to work with everybody and, and all of our regional partners to make this the best region possible. So that's sort of who we are. Here's what we do. We work in four areas. We bring companies and jobs to town. In the last nine years, 140 companies have moved their headquarters to Dallas, to the Dallas region. 140 companies in nine years. There's no metropolitan area even close to that in the country in terms of attracting business. A million new jobs have been created here in the last nine years. No place is even close to that. With the last three years, more jobs have been created in Dallas than anywhere else in the country. And so we attract companies and jobs. Second thing we do is we attract talent. And by that, I mean there are a lot of people, young people like, like all of you, around the country who are in areas that are not nearly as prosperous as Dallas. But we're growing so fast, we need more talent here all the time. And so we put out the word to places that aren't nearly as uh, prosperous as us, to young people especially, and say, come take a look at Dallas. Great quality of life, you know, great place to, to ra raise a family and have a career. So, so attracting talents, number two. Number three is we work really hard in education to make sure that our young people, especially in DISD, get the kind of education that they deserve so they can have a good, good education, a good job, a good life here. Uh, because there's so much prosperity going on around them, but a lot of them have not been able to partake in it in the past just because you know, they're not maybe in the best school system uh, as others are. So education and workforce are really important to us. We, our, our companies need a good workforce to, to, to stay strong. And then the fourth thing we work on is public policy. We work to make sure that everything that's happening in Austin, at City Hall, and in Washington is, is for the good of a great business climate, uh, pro-growth pro business, uh, so that we're looking down the road and we're keeping up with infrastructure, we're keeping up with education, and this place continues to be an attractive place. And then lastly, uh, we have five leadership programs. You probably know about some of them. We have a young professionals group like yours. We have Leadership Dallas, uh, which is sort of for the 35 to 45 year olds. Uh, and that's a very competitive process, but about 50 uh, uh, professionals a year are, are chosen for that. Then there's an alumni association of them. We have an executive women's round table for women executives and then welcoming new executives. So when a new CEO moves to town, we wanna to make sure that they get immersed in the community, meet others and feel welcomed. So that's a little bit about what we do. So clearly you have, oh, all people have access to company CEOs, um, many different resources, and in light of current circumstances, I'm sure you've heard a number of ways people are approaching COVID-19. Can you tell us what the DRC is doing uh, yourselves to address the pandemic? Yeah, when, it, when this first hit in mid-March, um, pulled my senior team together and, and we talked about what would be our most effective way to serve our members now. And we decided to, we have 13 different departments here. We have about 55 full-time staffers here. So we have 13 different departments. We decided to make two departments. You're either working now in communications or you're working in member engagement. So communications is, we made it into a fast-paced newsroom every day. We, we put out stories every day. We aggregate information from the governor and the mayor and the county judge. So you have the latest, if you go to our website. We do stories on the good works that our companies are doing, either best practices or charitable work that they're doing in the community. And we turn those things around every single day. 
We also do virtual meetings like Senator Cornyn has been on. Uh, um, gosh, Mark Cuban was on last week. Tomorrow, Ray Washburn is on. Ray owns uh, Highland Park Village. He owns uh, Me Casina, uh, a lot of retail. He's on the uh, White House Task Force on Economic Recovery, so he'll be a great guest tomorrow. So we do virtual meetings like that. And then we've also taken to doing meetings with every one of our members every month. So we have 800 members, and we, we, we invite 100 of them at a time to be on virtual meetings like this, and we tell them what we're doing, and we listen to what their needs are. And so there's a great two-way communication going on. So that's the communication side. On the member engagement side, we have just stayed really close to our members to see what they need sort of day to day. And what we want them to do is if they don't know where to turn, they should call us because we're in the middle of the action every single day here. We know a lot of people and we know how things work in this community. And we know, and, and, and so if they call and say, gosh, I can't figure this out, chances are we can help figure it out help them figure it out. And we can also connect them to somebody. They want to get a hearing from a public official or something on, on something that they're concerned about. We probably can connect them to that public official as well. So, so I think that is the way we've been serving is communicating, staying close to our members and connecting the dots for them. And between, you know, all the information that your communications team has gathered and everything you're hearing from members, how does the DRC see Dallas moving forward economically in the next six to 12 months? Well, we were flying high until COVID-19. As you, as you all know, you guys are in the real estate business. It's, it was amazing, right? No place like it. And then all of a sudden, boom, we hit the wall like everybody else did. We had a 3% unemployment here in mid-March, and now it's close to 30%. You know, we went from 400, we, we, we went from virtually no unemployment claims or very few to 400,000 new unemployment claims in the last month here. And so, and a lot of that is in businesses like sports, you know, think about nobody's going to sporting events now. Think about hospitality, you know, hotels, think about restaurants, any place where crowds can gather have been really devastated by this. And so, but, but, but here's, the, here's the good news for all of that. Um, our foundation is really strong here. Uh, we have a lot of assets. We, we're, we're a great business state. So first of all, people like Texas, right? They like to be in Texas. Secondly, uh, we're in a great location, the center of the country outside the snow belt. And we've got two great airports and two great airlines here that can go east and west very easily. So people like to locate here. Great cost of living. If you think about the cost of living in Dallas versus the East Coast, you know, Washington, uh, New York, Boston, we're way lower than, than that. On the West Coast, LA, San Francisco, Seattle, we're much lower cost of living there. And so it's still a very, very attractive place to come. And we've added one advantage, I think, since this whole thing's happened. And that is, we don't have density here. In New York City, New York City has 29,000 people per square mile. We have less than 4,000 people per square mile. So you get all the benefits of a big market, the fourth biggest market in the country, with all that goes with that, the talent, the, um, the, the proximity of a lot of businesses together, but you don't have density. And so here's, here's something that's happened in the last uh, month and a half. We had 30 companies looking to move here uh, a month and a half ago. Now we've got 45 companies looking to move here because they, and a lot of them are from those very dense areas and they say, we want out. <laughs> we don't want to pay, we don't want to pay the rents of New York City anymore. And we don't want the density of New York City anymore. Uh, and so they're looking at Dallas in a very serious way. So I think when we come out of all of this, whenever we do, and nobody knows when that's going to be, is it a year? Is it, is it two years? I don't know. But we're going to be in a very good position relative to a lot of other markets in the country. So as, you know, more new companies look to come here and as our, you know, existing businesses and offices start opening back up, what do you think that looks like here in Dallas as we quote, get back to work and what do you think will change or remain the same as, as we move forward? Well, we're doing a whole series called responsible return to work. 
and uh, you can go to our website and take a look at it. Um, you know, obviously the workspace is going to look different. It's at least for a while. Uh, I'm in my office for the second day today. Yesterday was a little spooky. It was it was it was a little weird coming in, and this is such a lively place with lively people. And to come in, and there was only eight of us here yesterday, I guess. And um, we're wearing masks, you know, and we're 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 not we're we're, we're distancing from each other, and we're doing virtual meetings. It's just so different. So, but I think uh, over time. If we get the, the virus uh, contained, then more and more people will start coming back to work. I think people have to be together, really. I think, uh, I think there'll probably be some businesses that can do more virtual work than they were doing in the past, but most people do better in a social situation, and I think, um, I think they also, I think ideas don't come as, as easily on a virtu in a virtual sense you know, as they do when you're together, I think. And, uh, and I think the, the other big part of this is, how do you acquire new customers virtually for clients? Mm -hmm. How do you retain clients as easily? Because the human connection, though it's, it's good, especially good for those you have a relationship with already and know very well, uh, you can get along with that for a while. That's why we did well as a staff, I think, through all this. But as time moves on, People come and people go, and you don't have those same relationships uh, that you did before. So I think there's the, the, the human contact is will always be necessary, and I can see, um, you know, I can, I think people once they start getting back to work are going to want to come back to work more than they think they're going to want to. So. It definitely has presented its its uh, a number of challenges. Um, and I think you know some some will strengthen us as a city, and some we will. Um, hope to just leave in the past and move forward to our new normal. Um, with that, you know, I have some more questions, but I would love to get the audience a chance. I know we have some questions from them, so I will hand it over to Kristen to uh, relay some some things that the audience may want to know more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi Dale, thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah. We do have a couple questions from the audience, so I'll jump right into them. Um, First one, what were some of the most effective strategies you implemented to ingrain yourself and demonstrate your competency in the varying cultures and operations of the organizations you worked for? You know, considering they likely had varying hierarchies and work styles. Yeah. So I would say I went to work every day. First of all, I have my entire career, I've gotten into the office before I was expected to be in the office. All right which is very, which I think sends a signal, right? Like a lot of places I start, we would start work at eight, I'd be there at 6.30. And that's, and I think that doing, just the act of doing that, and, and not goofing around when you're there, when you get in, you get right at it. I think that's like compound interest every single day. Mm -hmm. You do that an hour and a half early, you know, five days a week, that's seven and a half hours more that you've put in than somebody else uh over the course of the year that's 350 hours more than you put in so you put in basically nine weeks more than anybody else who's coming in to start the day just to, to get in under the wire of eight o'clock right and, and so i i always believed in getting to work early I, I also wanted to make myself as valuable to the organization as i could i looked for things to do to make myself valuable i i volunteered the things that nobody else wanted to do because they were tough. And I thought I could take them on and try to make something of them. Sometimes they took them on. Sometimes they come to me and say, um, we're giving you a new assignment. So, so the, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the downsides of taking on tough stuff is they'll also bring it to you after a while if they know you can get it done. But I also really tried to build relationships um, throughout my throughout the organization. Uh, I, I try to have great relationships with my peers, uh, with, my, with my staff, and then, and then with, the, with the, the higher ups as well. Uh, and not in any kind of a, I think there's something called the appropriateness of behavior. So there's, you know, there's uh, behavior that's appropriate in different situations. And I was always very, um, 
was deferential at the higher levels, but if they asked me to speak, I was confident in speaking because I had worked hard and knew what I was talking about. So I just think that, um, I think it's just paying attention. It's getting there early. It's, it's working really hard while you're there. It's really being good with people. You know, um, Aaron mentioned the idea that I had always been asked to come along, come, come with me, come with me, come with me. And I think a lot of that is uh, the idea that you want to be somebody that somebody wants to have around. You, you want to be, you know, you want to be fun. You know, you want, you, you want to be, uh, you want to be able to laugh with people. You want to be able to um, just be easy to be around. Uh, and, and you don't want to be edgy. You know, and I think that uh, I think that has a lot to do with people uh, kind of carrying you along a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, we'll do one last question, um, and because I know we're starting to run out of time, so um, as you know, well, I'll I'll go to this one since you know you talked a little bit about VRC and what um, you guys have going on, the different communications aspects that y'all are doing during this virtual time. Um, I also noticed, um, you know, that the, the chamber has talked about the jobs campaign and resources coming up. And so I'd, I'd love for you to have a chance to give a little plug for that. Um, as you, I'm sure are, you would probably guess, there are a few people on the call who um, will be looking for jobs as well soon and so um what ways can they also look to the, the chamber for that yeah thank you i, I completely forgot <laughs> about the jobs page so thank you Kristen, for bringing that up um when this all started we had a meeting uh uh the, ch the chamber the citizens council downtown dallas inc and uh visit dallas the, the former um dallas uh, convention visitors bureau the leaders of those organizations. And we said, what can we do right now? And, and Craig Davis, who's the new head of Visit Dallas said, you know, so many people are out of jobs, you know, restaurant workers, hotel workers, people in sports and so forth, airlines. And so we had the idea that we would do a website for people who were displaced from jobs through no fault of their own. They just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. They were in great industries up until a month and a half ago. Uh, but they, they were all of a sudden out, of, out on the street, no fault of their own. But there were or industries that were hiring, like grocery stores are hiring, and warehouses are hiring, and pharmacies are hiring. So could people go onto that website and find, you know, a thousand job openings? And that's about what we have now. I think is a thousand job openings on that website. So people can go on and look at it. It's been a huge success nearly 30, I think it's up to, well, 25,000 people, I think, have seen it to date, have gone on it. They're spending about, I don't know, four or five minutes on it, so they're spending a lot of time on it, and they've looked at uh, 200,000 jobs uh, during the time they've been on it. So, so it's been a big uh, success, and hopefully a lot of those folks have found jobs, and the companies that were looking to fill jobs are happy with it, too. So uh, that's one way we've been... <clears throat> I think very uh, helpful. The other way is uh, through this responsible return to work campaign. Uh, what we've done is taken like five or four or five uh, workspaces, like uh, if you're in retail or you're in manufacturing or construction or the office space, we have exemplars of companies that have gone back to work or have put together programs for what their offices are going to look like or need to look like to keep people healthy and safe. If you, if you don't know where to start, you can go into our website, say you're in retail, see what Target's done, and get an idea how you can start getting back to work as well. And um, so I think that's been helpful as well. Our next thing, we're really trying to decide what is the next big thing for us. We're really kind of thinking about how do you acquire customers virtually, you know, or clients, and how do you, uh, how do you retain uh, clients uh, vir virtually. That's, that's a tough one because usually that is very much a, a personal thing, a personal relationship thing. So we're hearing from a lot of folks that they're struggling with that a little bit. Great. Well, thank you so much again. Um, Aaron, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I know we're cutting it close on time.
Uh, thanks, awesome. Kristen. Good seeing you. Yes, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. But I want to thank you, Dale, for taking time under your schedule to speak with us and thank everyone else who joined uh, the virtual discussion. As I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. please call for some virtual networking. Uh, once in place into breakout groups, you can use one of the following questions as a discussion starter. Uh, the first being, what were your key takeaways on moving forward with the changes that have impacted the economy and business in Dallas? And the second being, what do you think about Dale's suggestions on how to strengthen us as a city during this time? So please stay on the line. And Dale, thank you again for taking the time with us. I've got a question for you, Aaron. How have, um, how have the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the chat rooms afterwards worked? Have you done this before? We've done it once before, um, about two weeks ago. And uh, basically, you know, Ring has, a, has an option where we can break into smaller groups and we basically start with some question, question and then allow people to take the conversation in any direction um, as they would like to. I think it's, you know, we've been, uh, for lack of a better word, struggling to find ways to connect these days and are looking for ways to provide value. And so we figure if we can't get together in person, getting together via video and catching up on and what different um, folks are doing in their industries or respective you know, real estate sectors has been uh, somewhat helpful and kind of um, the best option during these times. Yeah, great. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for that kind of thing too. What we do is, and this might be an idea for you, before events, we have like a little coffee hour where people can come out 15 minutes before and, um, and we just are there to greet them and we, you know, we, we goof around with them a little bit, ask about what's, what's behind them in their house and people can get to see them a little bit. And so we do a little bit beforehand and it seems to work fairly well too. Just to, and it's just a thought, but uh, we're, all, we're all struggling with the same thing, right? Well, it's, it's a great one and we are open to suggestions because we are, um going to have to be creative for the, for the rest of the year and, and foreseeable future. So um, we'll definitely kind of take that one and see if we can't implement it ourselves. Okay, great. I'd like to see you guys have a, a great leader in Linda McMahon. Love working with her. And, uh, and then Brian used to work for us. You guys all know Brian? Yes. Yeah, Br Brian used to work for the chamber and he's over at Trek now too. And uh, so he's a great guy too. So anyway, okay. All right, Thank guys. You. Thank you. you. Great to be with you. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you so much. Keep your chins up. It's going to get better. <laughs>